The Lord said, If any one would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father and the holy angels. And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. Today I start out a little bit differently. There was something that my grandfather always used to tell me. You're judged by the, the company you keep. Right? The people that you keep in your life make a difference. The people that you keep in your life often make the difference between you going down the narrow path and going down the wide and destructive path. I think we've all had friends on both sides. But the wiser we become, the wiser and the closer we get to the Lord, I think that we begin to understand how important that truly is. I start out today with that saying because there is a reference that comes in the Old Testament that is a prefigurement of the cross. After Moses and the Israelites had escaped from the bondage of Pharaoh. They had gone through the Red Sea. They had seen the miraculous thing where they had walked on dry land and in one, one swift blow, the army of the Egyptians was completely destroyed by the water. They were all drowned. They had followed the pillar of the cloud. They had followed the pillar of fire. They even drank from a rock where Moses had struck it with his staff. So that way that they would not thirst to death in the desert. And as soon as they came out of there, right, they encountered an army, an army that belonged to the Amalekites. Now the Amalekites is an interesting people because the Amalekites were descendants of Esau, the two brothers, Jacob and Esau, that one was the caretaker, the other one was the hunter, right? The one was wild. But Jacob, what he did when he's, his brother came in from the fields, his brother was completely famished. He was hungry. His brother could barely see straight. He was so hungry. And what happened? He says, I want a bowl of that lentil soup that you are cooking here, he told his brother Jacob. And his brother's like, no, I'm not going to give you anything. He says, give it to me, I'm famished. And he says, all right, Jacob says, I'll give it to you, but I'm going to give it to you for, my, for your inheritance. For this bowl of lentils, I want the inheritance that you've given me. And Esau agreed, gave him the inheritance that would have been rightfully his. Now Esau sold his inheritance, sold his birthright for his hunger. His Esau sold his inheritance 
for something that he craved in his flesh. Okay? That is the thing that we must keep in mind, that now the descendants of Esau, the Amalekites, as soon as they get past the Red Sea, as soon as they see all these miraculous things, they didn't go into an area of leisure. They went directly into war. Now here is where it comes in to have the right people in your corner, to have the right people in your life. When they encountered them at this battle of Rephidim, Moses instructs Joshua to take a few of the people. They weren't fighters. They weren't warriors. They were slaves. For 400 years they've been slaves. It's not like they were preparing and training to become fighters. So he selected, right? Joshua chose the people that he thought would best suit for the moment at hand. Because Moses told him, go and select a few people. So Joshua was selected. He chose people that would fight and fight well. Even though he had never seen them, he had probably known many of them by their character. Many of them by their tenacity. Many of them by their courage. Many of them by their strength. He had seen people working for years, cutting stone, moving stone, everything that you could possibly do as a slave. And some of those people you know were probably strong. And because of that strength, because of the grace of God, people endured for 400 years. Then Moses, what he did was he chose for himself also two people. He told Joshua, you go down and fight the battle. And I'm going to go to the top of the hill, and I'm going to oversee it. And he says, I'm going to take my staff. God told him what to do. Take your staff to the top of the hill, and take Aaron and Hur, Aaron, his brother, and Hur, a close, close friend that he trusted. Now, as Joshua was fighting the battle, he was fighting against, again, the Amalekites, right? Fighting against this people that had been at enmity with the people of Israel for years. And Moses, when he was standing on top, he rose his hands. The cross, right? The cross, a prefigurement of what Christ would do. He rose his hands with staff in hand. But as the battle, as the battle progressed throughout the day, you can imagine the heat, right? As it progressed through the day, Moses' his arms started to get tired. And as his arms started to drop, the Amalekites started to win. And then again, he raises up his hands again. And as his hands were up high, Joshua would win. Ah, Aaron and Hur said, let's push a rock underneath him. Let him sit down. And one on each side held up his arms. Held up his arms for the rest of the day into the night until Joshua became victorious. Today we celebrate the Sunday of the cross. And that story that I just told you in Exodus was specifically instructed by God for Moses to write down for the future generations to remember for us, too. For two future generations. And remember that Moses went to the battle not with the sword, but with the staff. The idea of the staff is all throughout the scriptures. Thy staff and thy rod, they comfort me, right? King David speaks about the staff. The staff is used to keep the sheep in line. And oftentimes, it has a hook, the shepherd's crook. So that way, when a sheep is going off astray, he hooks the sheep's leg, the leg and they pulls him close to him. But the staff, is designed to hold you to keep yourself up, but also designed to keep people in line, to keep the sheep in line. But today we 
celebrating the cross, where Jesus lifts up his arms, right? To give us the strength, Jesus became man, so that way we could become like God. The two natures of Christ were here on earth. When the Virgin Mary conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus came into the world. Jesus, the mighty warrior, right? But he did not come like they expected him to come. They expected them to come on the horse with a, war, with a shield and a sword and an army of heaven to destroy the oppressive Romans. But Jesus, he didn't come with the sword. He came with the staff. He came to teach people what it meant to be forgiven and how to forgive. His road to the cross. Today we celebrate the halfway point to Pascha, to the great and holy day of the resurrection. Today we celebrate the cross where Christ willingly went to and laid down his life for his friends, for us, his friends, to teach us that our flesh, our desires, our senses can be contained. All of us struggle with different things, every one of us. But how many times, especially in this present day and age, Jesus talks about that there will come a time, right? Today in the gospel, there, he says, there is an adulterous generation that's coming. An evil and adulterous generation, and Isaiah talks about it as well. There will be coming a time when they will call evil good and good evil. That day is here more than I've seen at any other time. How many people have traded their inheritance, traded what God has willingly given them, in order for them to get a pot of lentils? How many have traded their inheritance to buy shoes? How many have traded their inheritance to become something that they were not born to be? How many have traded their inheritance for a simple pot of stew? It circles back around to us. And that spirit that the Amalekites had is powerful. But God promised that he would wipe the Amalekites from the face of the earth. But it wasn't until centuries later Right? Because of one disobedience after the other, that they were finally wiped out. But that spirit of the Amalekites is still here. We trade the inheritance that we have for earthly gain, for what we see. So many people, so many people today struggle with pornography. So many people today struggle with violence, to just look at violence. Have you seen some of the movies that are coming out? More and more and more violence. Training and preparing the future generations to not see the violence at hand. More and more violence within the games that we play. So you become numb to it. I remember when I was back in the 80s, they had little bit, tiny things all along the way, even in the 70s, even in the 60s, that Hollywood would just interject just enough to throw something upside down. But now, what's upside down is the good. Now, what's upside down is what's holy, what's pure, what's righteous. Who we have in our lives makes a difference. So many of us, so many people choose spouses for ourselves because we're young. Our hormones are raging. And we think to ourselves, my sex life is going to get me through. 
until I am married to this person, and then it'll just keep me through. And then as soon as you marry that person, you realize I don't know who they are. And because of the desires of your heart, because of the desires of the flesh, you, so many people have gotten divorced. How many people, what's the statistic? 85% of marriages, second marriages, 65 to 75% of first marriages end in divorce. Because we choose people to be in our lives for the wrong reason. But persecution, when it comes and it's here, the last couple days, in London and in France, they were holding Good Friday services. And the police came into the church while they were holding Good Friday services and ordered them to stop service and told them if everybody does not leave, that they will arrest you. It's going to come to a point where we're going to have to make a decision. Do I want to worship or do I want to get arrested? If I get arrested, then I'll just worship in the jail. What did Paul and Silas do when they were chained? They worshipped in the jail. They sang praises in the jail. And the angel came and released them and opened the doors and released the chains. And the jailer came in, was ready to kill himself, and Paul's like, no, 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 we're still here. And that day, that jailer found salvation. The disciples chose people. Jesus sent them out two by two. He didn't send them out alone. Who we go through this life, who you take into this life, who you choose to help you go on top of the, of the hill to watch the battle, or while you're in the battle, who you have on top of the hill makes the difference. Are you going to have people that raise your hands so that way you're strong enough to endure? Or are you going to have people that just pander to you every need? It makes a difference, the company you keep. It makes a difference that you choose the right place to worship, that you have like-minded people that surround you, that you will have people that are strong enough to endure that we can continue to glorify God. Persecution weeds people out. Persecution draws out the people that just aren't strong enough. I want to be with the people that are strong. While I get ministry to the people that need the strength, that they're needing to be seen. When Jesus was heading to Golgotha, at one point he collapsed. He couldn't go on anymore. His body failed him. His flesh failed him. He could not pick up the cross. And they chose him. Simon of Cyrene. Come, help him pick up the cross. Help him carry the cross. And Simon went and picked up the cross and helped Jesus while holding Jesus in his arms, helped him carry the cross. There are times when all of us fall carrying our cross. There are times when all of us are weak, all of us fall and fail, and we fall down in our face, and we are so wounded by the sins and the transgressions that we have. That's what Jesus fell from, our wounds, our sins, our weakness. It wasn't his. Jesus fell because of the weight that he was carrying of the cross that he knew he was going to be holding up the earth. And it's hard to imagine it's hard to conceive that that moment in time when Jesus was crucified on the cross, when he was sit hanging on the cross, that that moment in time 
is still the moment in time that is reflected all the way from to Adam and Eve until the very end of time when the last person is conceived. That moment in time encirculates every single living being that has ever lived and will ever live. Yet, he is still raised from the dead. He is still resurrected. There is still a tomb. Now is the time for us to dig deep, to pick up our cross, to carry it. And if we need help, if we need the strength, there will be people there along the way to help you carry it. Now is the time to pick up our cross. This last year has shown us what it means to endure. Statistics, 40% of the churches. 40%. 40% of the church capacity is all that's been found. And we have to make a choice. All of us must make a choice. Joshua, his name means Savior. Yeshua. Jesus is our Savior. It's a prefigurement of what was happening. We're now in the battle fighting against the Amalekites. We're fighting against our eyes, our taste, our hearing, our feel, our smell. That's why when we come into the churches, Every single one of our senses has something to do. We see the icons. We smell the incense. We taste the bread, the communion, the Eucharist. We hear the chanting, and hopefully that the Holy Spirit is moving through you so that you can feel holiness and righteousness. Choose today who you will stand with, as Joshua and Moses asked. Again, as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 